Thank you. Well, thank you all for having me here today. Wow, that was a great picture of me. Um, what I do now is this project with NPR called Joe's Big Idea. Uh, it's an unfortunate title, and if you find me at some point today, I'll tell you why we came up with it. But uh, it's an attempt, as I say in my tagline, to understand the minds and motivations of scientists and inventors. And I've brought two of the people that, not the toothbrush guys, they're next year, but two of the people that I've interviewed as part of this project, and I've brought them along today. And normally, you know, I'm stuck with radio, but because this has a great big screen, I arranged with a, a really talented video producer named Heather Russo to take some video that we had and turn it into a brief introduction of the two people you're going to hear from. So. Ready to At see the time the NOAA was being treated, there were only nine proton beam radiation centers in the country. Uh, New York didn't even have one. We want to develop some software that will help a parent detect leukocoria. And they basically have no technology. And there were some beds that had four or five babies in a bed. And to go back the next day, and only one of those babies was still there. He was about six weeks old, and he just kind of would look up at the ceiling at the bright lights, or he would not really look at you eye to eye when he should have been. I mentioned it to Brian when I started to see the white reflection in the pictures. Brian and Elizabeth Shaw were about to learn that their young son Noah had something called leukocoria. <laughs> I almost just passed out <laughs> because I had read on the internet like what um, what it entailed. <laughs> And I just, at that moment, I thought we were going to lose our son. Today, the youngster is in remission, and his prognosis is good. You never know what he went through. With his prosthesis, you can hardly tell he is monocular, that he only has one eye. Noah has inspired his dad, a scientist, to invent something that could help other kids before it's too late. So I asked Dr. Mukai, what would have happened if we would have brought Noah in at 12 days old, or a month old? So he said he might not have lost his right eye. As moms, we really are, are motivated to try and bring the very best health care that we can to places in the, in the developing world. Because it doesn't take complicated technology to make a difference. We've developed a bubble CPAP device that allows babies that are struggling to breathe to have an easier time with breathing. And so what this device does is it puts pressurized air into their lungs. It keeps them inflated a little bit like a balloon being a bit inflated. It makes it much easier for them to get the oxygen they need so that they can thrive and grow and develop their lungs more effectively. No one person is going to solve these problems. It's going to take the team. And if we can pull that team together and teach students that they need to be part of a team from the beginning, then we will have success. So if you'll join me in welcoming Maria Odin and Brian Shaw to the stage. Okay, um, they're a little uh, shy, and uh, they're not really sure you want to hear from them. So would you mind clapping a little louder? <laughs> All right. I was going to keep you going until I got a standing ovation, oh. but <laughs> <laughs> the idea was just to wake everybody up. Um, I know this is serious stuff, and I don't want to make fun of it, but people get tired just before lunchtime. So you saw um, these two remarkable things that these people have worked on. I came to uh, Texas to talk with Maria, and I'd seen a report of this uh, uh, thing that she had developed, and I assumed that she was using the top designers and the top people, and I was sort of stunned when I figured out who was really behind this. So tell them about how this, this CPAP, first of all, what does it do, and then who made it? 
Sure, so the technologies that we develop at Rice um, in our Global Health Technologies program are designed by undergraduate students. And what we do is we identify real world problems. These are real issues. Babies are dying worldwide because they don't have the ability to breathe. And in, in Texas Children's Hospital, they have a, a device, um, bubble CPAP, that they put the babies on. And this um, device costs between eight and $32,000. And in the developing world where 98% of the babies that die in the first week of life are, um, they don't have $8,000 to spend on a system. And so we handed this problem to undergraduate students. And what's so amazing is that 18 to 22 year olds don't believe what they can't do. They believe that they can solve these problems. And we tell them they can, and they do. And the device that the students designed, uh, at the end of that first year they worked on it, cost $150, and it provided the same pressures and flows as the very fancy systems at our hospitals in the US. So wait a minute, uh, that was the other part. It was the tools. How do you take something that costs twenty or $30,000 and bring it down to $150? This is the part I love. <laughs> So um, we ask the students to be creative and, and figure out what is the essence of what this technology does? What, is, what does it need to do? So in this particular case, they went to aquarium pumps, aquarium pumps that are designed to run with no intervention for years on end, and they're fairly inexpensive, and they're able to provide the air in a way that, that works for the developing world, and, and these devices don't break like systems in the US. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> that's gonna be tricky. Um, okay, so Brian, um, the interesting thing about, I first met Brian a year ago yesterday. Actually, I didn't meet him, I met his son, Noah, a year ago yesterday. Um, we had met a few weeks earlier in Waco, Texas, which for some reason I was spending a lot of last year in Texas. But uh, I was in Waco and the nice lady from Baylor University press office said you should hear what Brian Shaw has to say he's got this amazing story because he's a chemist, but something really transformative happened to him when he was a postdoc at Harvard. And I said, oh yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to hear more about that, but then I didn't have a chance to get back to Waco. And then he called me up, um, or sent me an email just before PopTech and said, we're going to Boston uh, to have a checkup for our son Noah, and would you like to meet us there? So after spending two days with the PopTech fellows at the start of the week, here, I ran down to Boston for two days before coming back up to be at the, pot, at the session, and that's where I met Brian and the gang. And this story of a chemist who suddenly figures out that something big has happened to his life was just blew me away. So Brian, t t tell the story about how you, know, you, you wound up in this situation. Yeah, so I was a postdoc working in the Whitesides lab. and That's uh, George Whitesides, by the way, which some people in the audience are who are familiar with. And famous uh, I had just gotten married um, probably, I don't know, less than two years before this ordeal. So recently married, um, and uh, we had our first son, Noah. And uh, when he was three months old, his mother started noticing little white pupils in his baby pictures. This is called leukocoria. Um, and she had read in a parenting magazine that this could be a symptom of a, a really devastating uh, eye cancer called retinoblastoma that affects young kids, uh, just young kids. It only affects the developing retina. After the age of five, you're not susceptible to it. And I sort of blew it off, I, uh, be honest with you. Um, I uh, it was about two weeks before my first faculty interview, you know, getting ready to go on the job market. And I was like, okay. And you know, we had some other issues we were dealing with, being new parents. And, uh, um, but she, she, uh, she mentioned it to the pediatrician at the four month well baby visit. And pediatricians are supposed to screen for this. Looking, take, they just take a light and they shine it into the eye. And if there's a tumor, the tumor reflects light and you see a white reflection, a white pupillary reflex instead of a red one, which is what you should normally see. And the pediatrician saw it. And uh, I don't know why she didn't see it on the, on the previous visits, because the tumor was definitely there. Um, and he was, he was diagnosed uh, that afternoon by an ophthalmologist. So uh, a lot of chemotherapy, a lot of radiation. He ended up losing his right eye. It was in both eyes. It was worse than the right eye. And um, after the dust settled and the smoke cleared about two years later, I, uh, I was a new faculty member you know, at Baylor, figuring out what I wanted to research the rest of my life. And uh, 
I got curious about when did that white eye stuff start showing up? So I started looking back through all 9,000 pictures that my wife took mm -hmm. from birth through uh, about three years old. And uh, um, it started showing up at 12 days old. And it started showing up in more and more pictures because the tumors started getting bigger and bigger and they started multiplying. And so the magic angle that the camera needed to be at to get the light to go in, hit the tumor and come out uh, increased. And uh, so I thought, gosh, if we can have some software, maybe in a phone or a camera or in a, I don't know, social networking account, um, and, and that, could have, that could alert someone to the presence of this white eye, um, we, you know, we might be able to speed up diagnoses, and uh, that'll save vision and save life. So that's where the idea came from. Right, and, and this right? is the, par the part of the story that, I mean, even just hearing you say that again, the hairs on the back of my neck stand up when you realize that just in a snapshot that you were taking of your kid, it wouldn't scream out at you, but the fact that you could see indications of this white reflection at 12 days is just one of those blow me away moments. And the other part of it is that you take somebody who trains as a bioinorganic chemist, right? Yeah. And suddenly is faced with a problem and the tools come to bear that are not specific to white reflections coming out of eyeballs. But just to finish the story, the software now exists. Yeah, that's, yeah, we didn't, we did not uh, plan this timing, but the software became available on Monday. You can go download it. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> Um, it's free, it's a free app for the iPhone. We're working on a version for the Android. Um, Greg Hammerley, a computer science professor at Baylor and his student Ryan Henning um, did the computer science. It involved collecting a lot of pictures of kids with white eye who had retinoblastoma and uh, training the, the machine learning algorithm. So uh, it's called Cradle, Computer Assisted Detector of Leukocoria and you can find it on the App Store if you just uh, search white eye detector. And the software, it'll do two things. It'll look through your device, it'll find all your pictures, except for the ones in your email, and it'll search them for white eye. And if it finds it, it'll just let you know. It won't tell you what to do. Um, and then there's also a scanning mode where you can wave the camera in, in front of the kid's eye and the, uh, the light's on, on, on your, your iPhone. And uh, if it detects a white pupillary reflex like a pediatrician would detect, shining in the pen light or the ophthalmoscope, it'll put a red box around the eye um, and it'll say white. So um, hopefully this can speed up diagnoses and save life and vision. Actually, there's, there's, a, there's an interest, yes, <laughs> blows me away. But there's an interesting um, similarity here, which I, I, I'm gonna call attention to it because I've been thinking about it a lot. Brian was very careful to say, this is not a medical device, right? This is an amazingly complicated and, and interesting regulatory system that we're about to step into where these things that we carry around, these iPhones, not only can you use them as, as fitness detectors and heart rate monitors and movement activity, but, but they're beginning to have um, medical, absolutely medical implications. And I was wondering, you know, how do you, it's one thing to have the idea to make the, the, the CPAP, bubble CPAP. How do you decide, look, we don't want to hook it up to somebody and have it fail. It's not being FDA reviewed. How do you deal with that kind of hurdle? So for um, the work that we're doing in the developing world, um, we do multiple steps. So actually one of the students that designed, um, originally designed the CPAP device, took it with some MBA students and they went on a trip to numerous places in the developing world and doctors wanted it. They literally were grabbing it out of her hand and saying, look at this baby, we can put it on. And she said, but we have to test it. We can't just, even though it gives the pressures and flows that we um, are expecting, we need to do a full test. And that's what we ended up doing is we um, designed a clinical trial and did it in the developing world. We did it at uh, Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital in Malawi, um, getting ethics board approval both at our own institution and in the country of Malawi. Um, and that having successful results from there, um, we're now moving on with it. What we've chosen to do, we're not getting um, regulatory approval in the US, so we're not going through FDA, but we are getting a CE mark. Um, and What's that? It's a regulatory approval um, that is about good manufacturing practices, mm -hmm. and it's a European mark. Um, and that is uh, one of the things that some of the countries we're working in will accept. 
And um, for me, the clinical trial, really going through a very careful clinical trial to demonstrate that it's effective was critically important for us. And, and that's how I think any medical technology, you have to go through that process. I'm not sure if you're never gonna sell it in the US, we need to go through the FDA process. So, Brian, but so you're you're not doing that now. Yeah, my, my, I'm I'm taking a bit of a different different angle at this because uh, kind of my personal experience, um, doctors just don't detect retinoblastoma. I mean, the, the lawyers tell you this when you call them up, uh, interested in malpractice. It's parents that often initiate the diagnosis of retinoblastoma. They don't make the diagnosis, but they initiate it, and they initiate it because they see recurrent, persistent wide eye in their pictures, and they go tell the doctor, and then the doctor finally looks. So, you, you know, as nasty as this cancer is, okay, the one nice thing about it is you can just see it by looking in the eye. And a, and a mom or a dad is going to scan the retina of their child thousands of times in the first few years of life by just taking pictures. So, um, I want this in the hands, in the hands of parents. Um, there's some doctors who are interested in it too, um, but yeah, I haven't even, I haven't even really thought about the FDA stuff. I'm just kind of making it up as I go. It's not my <laughs> expertise. I'm a chemist, and uh, actually, I shouldn't even really be working on this, um, but uh, <laughs> since I met you, everyone's happy about it now in my department, <laughs> so. Uh, yeah. An agent for change. <laughs> but, but seriously, the, the, part, the part that, that I think speaks to this conference, and, and, and this is, maybe it's a department chair, maybe it's a regulatory official, maybe it's a lawyer, maybe it's a somebody, but was there at some point somebody said to you, this is really stupid, you shouldn't be doing this, why are you wasting your time? Yeah, yeah, the reviewers at the NIH. Um, <laughs> I'll be it sure to tell It my... doesn't kill enough kids. Uh, I got one comment saying, it's not gonna work in night vision mode. I'm like, <laughs> this, is, this is on the, re the summary statement I get back. I have the names of the people that were on. All right, the, all right, the, don't be. <laughs> I have a wall Let's of shame. Let's not take this I, personally here. <laughs> uh, no, no you, you get a little bit of that, but you also have so many people cheering you on that that wins out. Mm -hmm. So in the case of, of our um, work, so I do work in global health technologies, but a little more broadly, we have an engineering design studio at Rice where the students do global health technology work, but they also do work in real world design challenges of all types. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's very important that our students are working on real world projects from the beginning. And when we opened the design kitchen, which was five years ago, we thought it was gonna be a great place. You know, we're thinking as acad academicians, right? It, we're gonna teach our seniors in this place. This is where they're gonna do senior design projects. And the truth was that freshmen were coming in saying, but I'm not waiting three years to get access to this wonderful facility where I can prototype and try out my ideas. I wanna do it now. And so for me, the uh, convincing of the higher ups that we should expand this facility and make it work for freshmen um, came because the freshmen were telling me, we came here to do this, this is why we want to, to come to your institution, and we want to make change, we want to make a difference. And, and my job as, as the director of this facility was to facilitate that for them. That's so cool. Now, we have a, a few minutes before the obsessive compulsives get to do the hand washing thing. <laughs> so um, if anybody would like to ask a question, I, I so enjoy having help when I do this job because I don't have to do it all by myself. But if you have a question you'd like to ask, there are microphones, say loudly. Ah, somebody up top who is getting the microphone. So there will be a question. Coming along, one more, one more, there, hello. one, hello. You, you mentioned that you weren't going after FDA approval and yet the cost of a machine that does the same thing but isn't as reliable is contributing to the high cost of health care here. Why aren't you going after FDA so, approval? Um, so I wouldn't say the devices that are here are less reliable. They, when they break, they require really advanced technicians to fix them. Um, and so that's one of the challenges. So our device has a bit, a few fewer um, bells and whistles. Uh, and what it does, it does quite well, um, but it is very bare bones. And I'm not sure right now that our medical establishment would accept that. Um, it, it does provide the pressures and flows that these babies need, 
Um, it doesn't do heat and humidification, and that's a piece that uh, can be very important in the very smallest babies. For the groups that we're working with, um, they're not quite as young, they're not quite as premature, and they don't need it as much. Um, so I, I think as of now, we've chosen not to go in that direction. I, I personally agree with you that there are places in our own country that we should be looking at. Can we develop technologies that are appropriate and right for um, use here? And, and in those cases, we would go through FDA. Thanks, we got another question. Someone's already got the mic, so. Hi, my name is Pete. I'm from Denmark. Uh, are you familiar with, I'm sure you are, but the equipment for old men like me who have sleep apnea? Yes. Uh, it sounds very similar to that. It's similar, not exactly the same, well, um, but what, similar. What's the, the big difference? I'm just thinking, I get air pumped into my lungs every night so I stay alive. <laughs> yeah, so the pressures and flows are slightly different. How, what a baby's lungs can take and need are, are a little bit different. And in the case of our device, we don't have, um, it's very important for the neonates that we control the pressure very carefully. And we, the pressure control system we have is just a column of water uh, with air bubbling. So it's sort of basic physics and it's not a complex um, uh, control system. And so that makes a really big difference uh, for its ability to get repaired and, and to get used. Let's take another question from there. So you have a, a great opportunity to go from this rebellion to change. Why don't you make public those letters that you receive from the NIJ's review boards so that ah. this actually starts to change? Well, they're, they're, I'm, I'm on the tenure track, which... <laughs> Wait, wait, wait. No, I, no. I could tell that wait. I don't have to explain wait. to anybody what that means. No, wait. <laughs> but that means I go on the tenure tour, too, and I give talks. And uh, I have those slides ready with those names. I got the wall of shame. I got the acknowledgment section, and then I got the disacknowledgments. So uh, I, I don't know if I'm going to use them or not. I, I haven't made up my mind yet. But uh, you know what? I don't need their money. I don't need any of it. We're, we're doing it on a low budget and uh, we're, we're making it happen, so. Um, uh, I don't know, my answer. I, this, is, this is the first time I think in living memory that someone's heard a scientist say, I don't need their money. <laughs> um, he doesn't believe you. But just I get my other research funded, right. I mean, just, I do. In so SF, I, DOD, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a slacker or anything. Just, 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 just because I'm an expert in time management, I'm not gonna take any more questions. I'm sorry, I like doing that. It was a lot of fun, thank you for asking. But, but I do wanna leave you both a chance to just give a thought about this. It does feel like both of you are challenging a, a, a kind of a status quo about how things get implemented. And, and I really like that. And, and I think, um, you know, to anybody who supports this kind of work and thinks it's a good idea, yeah, you should, you should definitely um, keep an eye out for this and, and support it. And also tell me about it. Because the, to the extent that I at NPR can find these things and talk about them, I'm really, I'm really in, thrilled with the ability to be part of things changing a bit. So thank you very much for your attention. And we'll see you next year.